Hello, Dr. Francis Kanene here, and you're welcome to PPL 324 Law of Thought 2. I'm sure you have enjoyed our previous lessons and you have enjoyed watching the instructional videos. And beyond enjoying, I hope that you have learned something, in fact, a lot of things. So, we're going to be learning something new again in this video. We're going to be taking an, another important topic in law of thoughts and as usual i'm counting on you to pay attention to take notes if you have to to take part in the activities think about what you will hear and try and learn whatever lessons are available to be learned okay so let's go so some of the things that you will learn in this lesson are the importance of the case of rylands and fletcher for the strict liability rule, the analysis of the rule in that case, including the scope, exceptions, and defenses, the relevance of the rule to animals, and exceptions as well as defenses. Let's go on. The strict liability rule is also called the rule in Rylands and Fletcher. That's because the rule originated in that case. What happened basically in that case was that the defendant engaged contractors to build a reservoir for him, you know, so, so he could gather water for his mill. And then the contractors came and when they built the reservoir, saw a mine shaft that was disused, but they didn't bother to block it. And so when the reservoir was full, water escaped through that mine shaft onto the land of the plaintiff and caused a lot of damage. So the plaintiff went to court. Unfortunately, there was no way, to, no way to classify that claim under any other thought. It wasn't necessarily negligence, there was no nuisance, um, there was no trespass and all of that. And so the court held that even though you couldn't classify it under the others, there was strict liability on the part of the defendant to ensure that no damage was done because of the risk of um, damage from such the introduction of the, the um, water. And so that was the beginning of the strict liability rule. We'll talk about the elements shortly. Um, you look at the co um, cases of um, Kronos and Amasham burial board and pointing and nooks. You will see also where the, the rule was further explained. Now let's talk about the scope of the rule. There are three major things that must be in existence. First, it must be proven that the defendant or his agent or an independent contractor that he has engaged has brought a non-natural user to his land or her land. Note that it is a non-natural user not something that is naturally occurring on the land, but a non-natural um, occurrence. And non-natural occurrence can also be maybe a tree, which is natural, but was planted, a tree which uh, the defendant brought onto his land and planted. And then there was an escape of that non-natural user to a place outside the defendant's control. And that escape caused damage to the plaintiff. All of these things I'm talking about are questions of fact. They must be proven. It doesn't matter, you know, whether it was due to negligence or whatever, but they must be proven. And if the plaintiff is able to prove these three elements, then the court will hold that there will strict liability on the part of the Now let's differentiate between strict liability and nuisance. First of all, is that for strict liability, physical objects are introduced. Not the same for nuisance. Intangible items like noise and smoke can also constitute nuisance. And then there's a need for accumulation for strict liability. And then there is a need for an escape of that physical object or whatever was accumulated which is not required for nuisance. And then what escapes must be a non-natural user, you know, and we explained what a non-natural user is. 
and then the plaintiff does not need to be an occupier of the adjoining land for there to be strict liability. But parties next to themselves is important for um, um, nuisance. Okay, but you must differentiate. In the case of public nuisance, there's no need for adjoining property, of course. You know, the strict liability rule has been applied in Nigeria, but in a few cases, and majorly it's been in cases between um, individuals and government or major companies. So if you look at the first case was in Umuji and Shell BP, where there was an escape of oil waste to the plaintiff's land, and then Shell diverted the natural course of the stream such that Mr. Umuji could not fish. And the court held that the escape of waste was strict liability. However, diverting the course of the stream was not strict liability. Then in Nepa and Ali, where Nepa, a Nepa transformer caused fire, caused fire and caused damage to Ali's land, there was held to be strict liability. Same for Nepa and Akwata, where Akwata had constructed his house subject to all the rebuilding regulations and all that, and then Nepa came and built a transmission power line over his property. The court held that there was strict now there are defenses to strict to lab, uh, strict liability, and we we'll look at some of them. But note that defenses are question of fact also. So if a party has a defense, he must be able to prove it. And some defenses are act of God, the fault of the plaintiff, or the consent of the plaintiff to the escape. You know, contributory negligence of the plaintiff. So if the plaintiff was negligent and it was his negligence that caused the damage then there will be no um, the lab, uh, dependent will not be liable the act of a stranger or third party please differentiate between this and an agent or contractor specifically engaged by the defendant and then statutory authority statutory authority does not negate liability for damage and we have seen that in the case the two cases we looked at nepa and aquata nepa and... so let's quickly take an activity to deepen our knowledge i want you to differentiate between strict liability and nuisance let's just take a few seconds and do that Okay, moving on, and let's look at another form of strict liability. This time, strict liability for animals. First, what is an animal? An animal is any creature living in land or water, but excluding human beings. Usually, animals are classified as domestic or wild. But please note that for law, for tort law, the classification is three. You have livestock, you have dangerous animals, and you have non-dangerous animals. Livestock, of course, are animals that they are not wild in nature. They are usually for um, um, agricultural purposes and they do not include cats and dogs. Dangerous animals are wild animals. They are wild in nature. They are likely to attack and cause damage, injury or death if they are not restrained properly. And then non-dangerous animals are, of course, animals tamed by man and um, Liability depends also on question of facts. So examples would be your cats and your dog. Okay, now let's look at liability for livestock. First of all, we need to note who the keeper of livestock or animal, any animal is, right? Now the keeper is the owner of the animal and any servant, agent or proxy that he authorizes, the owner authorizes to keep or look after the animal. So, for instance, if you look at the image before you, the headsman may not be the owner of this cattle, okay, but he has been authorized to keep and look after them. So, he will be the whatever he does, right, the owner of the uh, livestock will be liable for them. So, of course, the ability is on the owner of the keeper of the animal. The keeper of the animal does so at his own risk because it is expected that he should know that. He needs to rein in 
livestock. So if it does not rain in the livestock and the livestock damages any um, item of a, another party, then he will be held liable. Also, if the livestock, if there's trespass, he will also be held liable. And it doesn't matter whether the keeper of the animal was um, negligent or not. Liability is strict. That's what we need to know for liability. And then liability for dangerous animals. The keeper of a dangerous uh, animal is strictly liable. In the first place, you can't keep a dangerous animal if you have not obtained special license from the government to keep that dangerous animal. We know there are people who keep snakes and lions and all of that in their homes. Okay, but without license, proper license, it is um, illegal. And of course, if any party who keeps a dangerous animal in his house runs the risk, you know, it's, it's, it's done at his own risk and therefore he will be liable for any damage caused by that dangerous animal. As I said, it is strict liability. Doesn't matter whether it was they were neg um, there was negligence involved or not. And usually, an action um, to claim for la the um, the damage caused by a dangerous animal is usually under the Skienta um, rule. Okay, and Skienta rule re basically points out that first the animal was dangerous, and then there was knowledge of the animals the animal being dangerous and but please note that whether or not you know for um, wild animals the liability is strict okay. now for non-dangerous animal the skenta rule will also apply however the liability is not as strict as for dangerous animals of course remember what you said about who the keeper is it doesn't necessarily have to be the owner it might be somebody authorized to take care of the animal if there's any damage from um, um, the, the dangerous animal to the plaintiff, then the owner of the, sorry, the non-dangerous animal to the plaintiff, then the owner will be liable. If he knew of the savage disposition or propensity to cause damage for the non-dangerous animal. And this doesn't mean Oh, he has beaten somebody in the past. He has um, whatever he has. He caused damage. It might just be that he's a very vicious dog. It jumps a lot. It um, attacks fences and all of that. Again, this is a question of fact. So what are the defenses open to keepers of animals? First is the fault of the plaintiff. Second is contributory negligence, just like you have for strict liability for non-natural um, user. Third is consent. Fourth is act of a third party and, of course, an act of God. Note, however, that the extent to which these defenses may be open may be impacted by the nature of the animal that is being kept. So if it is a da dangerous animal, um, the, the defenses may not be so, you know, available because the owner of the dangerous animal ought to have obtained license and ought to know that he has to go the extra mile to keep, to rein them in. Now, there are many remedies available to a party who, to whom da damage, you know, has been done. There's the remedy of self-defense. He can seek damages. He can seek restitution. He can go to court and get an injunction against the keeper and, you know, to rein in his animal and all that. He can, the animal can be placed in isolation. There can be an order of abatement, meaning that the owner of the animal should cause that damage to stop. There can be the arrest or seizure of the animal or the animal can be released to a wild forest if it is a wild animal and that will include repatriation to the country of origin if where it is is not um, conducive for its you know existence in the wild there can be confinement in the zoo the animal can be slaughtered particularly for animals that are dis have diseases so they can be slaughtered and all that there are many other defenses so to deepen our knowledge let's do a second activity I want you to state the classification of animals in thoughts. 
and then the liability for each of these classes of animals. Just take a few seconds and think about that, please. Okay. So, some of the things we have learned in this lesson are the strict, what strict liability means, when the rule in Rylands and Fletcher, the scope and elements of that rule, and defenses to the rule. We have also learned about strict liability for animals, and we have learned how animals are classified, the liability for each of these classes, the, the defenses available to the owner of such animals, and remedies to anyone who has suffered harm. Okay, so um, if you have any, please feel free to ask, and you can do that by posting it on the discussion forum, and then we'll discuss it. You can also download the video and watch it over and over again to help you to understand better. So until we see at the next class, thank you for joining.